Who do you think of when you hear the words presidential assassination? Over the course of American history, four sitting presidents have been assassinated. Of course, there's the more famous ones like Lincoln and JFK, but in this video, I'm gonna give you a quick rundown of all of them. This video, of course, covers presidents who were assassinated, not the ones that were almost assassinated or that died of natural causes. Sorry to all the William Henry Harrison stands out there. If you enjoyed the video, the nicest thing you can do is leave a comment down below, like, subscribe, and send the video to a friend. If you're feeling extra generous, you can even support my content on Patreon. Abraham Lincoln became the first president to ever be assassinated on April 14th, 1865, only 41 days into his second term and five days after the Confederate surrender. If there's one presidential assassination that people know about, well, it's this one and that other one, but that's for later. Having just spent his entire first term leading the country through a brutal civil war, Lincoln was no stranger to death threats. Abraham Lincoln was exhausted from leading the country through years of civil war, and while the work was certainly not done, it seemed like like the worst days of the country were over. The president visited Ford's theater with his wife, Mary Todd, to watch a production of the play, My American Cousin. The story goes that Lincoln was actually quite reluctant to go to Ford's theater that night, but felt obligated to because people knew that the president was going to be there. Future president Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia, were invited to accompany the Lincolns that night, but declined the invitation. Someone who did attend that night, however, was the Confederate sympathizing actor, John Wilkes Booth, who, as we all know, was not a part of the performance. Not a planned one, at least. Booth used his connections as an actor that night to gain entrance to Ford's theater where he shot the president in the back of the head. Booth would then jump out of the president's box and onto the stage where he broke his leg and shouted Six Semper Tyrannis, which translates to thus always to tyrants, the state motto of Virginia and a phrase commonly associated with Brutus. Lincoln's assassination was part of a conspiracy to murder four union leaders, including the aforementioned Grant, though Lincoln's was the only successful killing. Booth was able to flee Washington, D.C. before heading to Maryland, where he received medical attention from a Confederate sympathizing doctor. Believe it or not, Booth was shocked to learn that he was being perceived as a villain and not a hero. Gosh, I wonder why. It's not like you killed the president or anything. He attempted to flee to Virginia, but failed, likely due to his broken leg. On April 26, Union troops located and surrounded Booth in a barn where a standoff ensued. The troops wanted to take him alive, but there was little cooperation. They would eventually set the barn on fire, causing Booth to run out where he was promptly shot. Abraham Lincoln is the only presidential assassination I remember learning about in elementary school. It's a central part of Abraham Lincoln's mythos and the history of the Civil War period. It's pretty well known, but I couldn't help but mention the story of Samuel Seymour, a 95-year-old man who appeared on the game show I've Got a Secret in 1956, where people try to figure out the secret of one of the guests. Now, sir, if you'll whisper your secret to me, I'm sure the folks at home would like to know what it is. He found out about Mr. Seymour through a recent article in the American Weekly and said, I saw Lincoln shot. And this article is by Samuel J. Seymour. And it goes on to say that Mr. Seymour was five years old at the time. He had been taken to Ford's Theater by some good friends. And the curious thing was that in, when he was in, in, in this youth, five years of age, when he saw Booth jump from the box to the stage, at which time he broke his leg, his only concern was not for the president, because he didn't realize that the president had been shot, but the poor man who fell out of the balcony. And that's all of his memory is of going to the theater and seeing a man fall out of the balcony. Seymour's story is an example of just how short American history really is. A man who witnessed the first presidential assassination came within a few years of witnessing the most recent one. The fact that he was born during the presidency of James Buchanan right before the outbreak of the Civil War and lived on to see both world wars and pass away during the Eisenhower administration is honestly mind-blowing. On a trip to the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., I was particularly struck by a few molds of Lincoln that were on display. The one on the left is from 1860, while the one on the right is 1865, and you can really see the toll that the war took on him. My fascination with history has always been focused on the storytelling aspect of it, which can make it seem like something pretty far away. But when looking at people like Mr. Seymour or artifacts of Lincoln's life, everything suddenly becomes way more real. On a brighter note, during that same trip to DC, my friends and I were trying to find a place to eat breakfast, and we ended up finding somewhere called Lincoln's Waffle 
schools. And I remember thinking, oh, it's president themed. It's kind of cute. And then realizing that we were across the street from Ford's theater. It was really interesting to see that a century and a half after the assassination of one of our greatest leaders, we have a cute little waffle shop named after him right next to the place where he got shot. Say what you want about it being morbid, but it is certainly very American. If you're watching this video, you probably love history and stories and you should have a space that reflects that. This video sponsor, Bobbletopia, has awesome bobbleheads of presidents like Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy, along with some of your favorite characters from movies and TV. Use code Andre Dutcher for 10% off your bobblehead of choice and make sure to let me know which one you get in the comment section down below. Any purchase you make directly helps out the channel and it's a great way to support these videos if you enjoy them. President James Garfield is perhaps the greatest missed opportunity in American history. Garfield had served only 121 days as president before being shot at a railroad station. Garfield had served in the Civil War and in the United States House of Representatives as a radical Republican who often thought that Abraham Lincoln didn't go far enough on civil rights. Garfield had won by a very narrow margin and had barely begun his term by the time of his assassination and is often regarded as one of our most intellectual presidents. He was leaving DC to see his wife in New Jersey, who was very sick at the time, when he was shot twice in the chest by a madman named Charles Gateau, who had been a swindler and part of a religious cult. Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, was President Garfield's Secretary of War and was actually present for Garfield's assassination. It's widely believed that Garfield could have survived if he had not been examined with unsanitized medical tools thanks to the unsophisticated medicine of the time. Garfield was able to hang on until the 200th day of his short presidency before ultimately succumbing to his wounds. The 48-year-old Garfield was the youngest president ever to die before the assassination of 46-year-old John F. Kennedy. The trial of President Garfield's assassin, Charles Gateau, was one of the most bizarre trials in American history. Gateau would ramble incoherently for long periods of time, reciting delusional poetry that he had written along with an entire self-serving autobiography he created while in court. This strange assassin was a religious fanatic who believed he had been ordained by God to make Charles A. Arthur, who he supported politically, the president instead of James Garfield and even wanted to run for president himself in the future, as ridiculous as that sounds. He had led a life of attention seeking and felt he was finally getting the recognition he deserved, even acting like a celebrity at his own execution where he wished to have an orchestra play while he recited a poem that he had written. Gateau fits the archetype type of someone who would assassinate a president, having a long history of extremism and frankly fringe political opinions. Garfield's assassination didn't really prompt stronger protection for American presidents and it would take William McKinley to be assassinated before any proper protective measures were put in place. The biggest consequence of James Garfield's assassination is bringing President Chester A. Arthur to power. Arthur had been a Gilded Age politician who benefited greatly from the spoil system, but started advocating for a civil service reform law that would limit corruption in Washington and the buying of political power with the Pendleton Act. Garfield only recently started getting recognition as a missed opportunity who could have stood out from the corruption of the Gilded Age. This assassination reflects the true sadness that comes from a life with such potential being cut short too early. Today, we can only speculate about what James Garfield would have accomplished if he had been allowed to continue his life and presidency. William McKinley won a war, annexed multiple territories, and got assassinated by an anarchist. Why do people not talk about him? Oh yeah, that's why. Civil War veteran, United States Congressman, and Governor of Ohio, William McKinley was first elected president in 1896. During his administration, the United States would win the Spanish-American War and expand the American Empire by adding Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Guam, and the Philippines. That's a whole lot of imperialism. There was growing dissent among some groups of Americans. In walks the anarchist movement, which advocated for a completely stateless society. After attending the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, and giving a speech there, McKinley began greeting the crowd, shaking hands, and doing your generic politician stuff. 
When it was Leon Sholgosh's turn to shake hands with McKinley, he revealed a gun that he had hidden under a handkerchief, which he used to promptly shoot the president twice in the stomach. McKinley held on for a few days, and his prospects for recovering looked pretty good, but he would still end up passing away. Though McKinley is mostly forgotten, his assassination was pretty consequential. Sholgosh was a natural-born American citizen of Polish descent, which added to the perception of ideologies such as anarchism being dangerous threats from outside of the U.S. This would result in the Immigration Act of 1903, which could bar anyone associated with anarchism from entering the country. Given just how many presidential assassinations were happening, the Secret Service was officially tasked with protecting the president. Of course, McKinley's vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, would assume the presidency and become an exciting figure, to say the least. Roosevelt himself survived an assassination attempt, and you should check out my video on him to learn more. John F. Kennedy was born to a prominent Irish Catholic Catholic family in New England. He studied at Harvard, served in World War II, and became a United States Senator for Massachusetts before being elected President of the United States. He married a prominent socialite named Jacqueline Kennedy, who helped him conjure an image of American royalty during his presidency. The gruesome assassination of JFK took the nation by surprise in 1963. There hadn't been a presidential assassination since William McKinley in 1901, so the public wasn't expecting it at all. The Kennedy assassination would become extremely controversial and even more famous than Lincoln's as it's the only presidential assassination to be caught on video. Despite his difficulties with Cuba, Cuba and the Southern Democrats, the handsome young president had charmed the American public and represented a picturesque vision of America going forward. This idealistic picture of Kennedy is in stark contrast to the brutal end of his presidency that would occur in Dallas, Texas. The assassination of John F. Kennedy has made him one of the most talked about figures in American history with endless discussion and conspiracies surrounding his death. It's honestly impossible to talk about the Kennedy assassination without addressing some of the conspiracies around it. A lot of these conspiracies stem from the fact that it was the only presidential assassination to ever be caught on camera. A man named Abraham Zapruder shot what is now known as the Zapruder film, which provided a clear picture of the moment that the president was shot. The assassin Lee Harvey Oswald was a former Marine who had previously defected to the Soviet Union. After fleeing the Texas School Book Depository, Oswald killed a police officer before being apprehended by police. While on the way to his trial, Oswald was shot on live television by a man named Jack Ruby. This is where a lot of the conspiracies stem from, as Ruby was connected to organized crime. The murderer moves in, and here is the shame of all America, as Jack Rubenstein takes the law unto himself. Many people believe that Kennedy was killed in a conspiracy, or that Lee Harvey Oswald had not acted alone, or was simply a patsy for a larger group. This bizarre sequence of double killings raised great questions. Who actually fired the shots that killed Kennedy? Why did Ruby shoot Oswald? Was there a conspiracy? The new president, Lyndon Johnson, ordered these questions answered. He appointed a commission of seven prominent Americans to investigate the whole affair. He literally drafted Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren as chairman. The Warren Commission concluded that Oswald was the sole perpetrator of the assassination. In a lot of ways, the Kennedy legacy was frozen in time because of the assassination. The president had fumbled the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba and lost the support of conservative Democrats in the South because he was a Catholic from New England. Suddenly, he wasn't just the youngest president ever elected, he was the youngest president ever to die. The sympathy felt around Kennedy's death allowed the new president, Lyndon B. Johnson, to pass reforms that would have had a much more difficult difficult time passing otherwise, such as his Great Society and the Civil Rights Act. There's various pieces of iconic imagery that originated from Kennedy's death, such as the image of Lyndon B. Johnson being sworn in as president on Air Force One while Kennedy's casket was still on board. The striking image of Jackie Kennedy wearing the outfit with her husband's blood on it still haunts the American psyche as a reminder of what happened on that tragic day. Kennedy's death marked the symbolic end of post-World War II optimism and marked the beginning of a dark period in American history that would see various assassinations, the resignation of Richard Nixon, and the Vietnam War. 
I really want to make a video about the 60s, so be on the lookout for that. I would love to hear any ideas you guys have on stuff that I should include. Kennedy's assassination is also notable as part of the Kennedy curse, which would also include the assassination of his younger brother and presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy less than a decade after his own. An interesting thing to note is that all four presidents who were assassinated in office were elected in years ending with zero. Lincoln in 1860, Garfield in 1880, McKinley in 1900, and Kennedy in 1960. Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980 and of course ended up surviving an assassination attempt where he had been shot. George Bush, who was elected in 2000, had a hand grenade thrown at him, which failed to explode. In addition to that, two presidents who died from natural causes were elected in years ending with zero. FDR in 1940 and William Henry Harrison in 1840. Some have attributed this to the curse of Tippecanoe, which I won't be getting into in this video, but it has to do with William Henry Harrison. He always comes back. So if you want to be president, maybe don't run in a year ending with zero. Good luck, Joe Biden. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, or even supporting me on Patreon. Also make sure to check out the sponsor of this video, Bobbletopia. Once again, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next week.